but it says William Miller. I'm not going to read through that. Um, I, that's not really part of my presentation. I have that in there kind of as a novelty. I'm going to deal with William Miller a little bit here at the beginning of my presentations, and you'll <coughs> you'll find in here the breakdown of what William means, means will and helmet, and then you'll see some references from the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible um, that the helmet represents salvation and will represents doing the will of God. So William Miller is one that brought, who fulfilled the will of God in bringing the everlasting gospel of salvation to mankind. And the word Miller means, um, you have it at the bottom of page three, one that gra grinds grain and flour, one that separates the sheep, the wheat from the chaff. And certainly that is one of the truths we understand about William Miller, his method of study, his method of separating the wheat and chaff um, is what produced the understanding in the Millerite history and it's what Sister White recommends that those that proclaim the third angel's message do as well. We were to be studying on the same plan adopted by William Miller. Then you have a brief overview of his history. So what I'm saying is that when it comes to William Miller, his name corresponds to his ministry. You can look at that on your own time. I'm going to begin on page five and put some things in place about m who Miller was in order to identify what he represents for us here at the end of the world. In Great Controversy 6, 336, um, Sister White, you can see it in boldface, don't necessarily have to read that. She calls him the messenger himself. William Miller was the messenger of the first angel that the Lord used to bring the first angel's message to that history. Um, early writings, page 235, speaking of um, Miller says, ministers who would not accept this saving message themselves hindered those who would have received it. Now, let me say something, just th that isn't a, I keep hearing this microphone kind of go loud, is that bad? <laughs> bugs me. No. Testing, testing. There you go. Was it? Okay. Testing, 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 testing. Is that is it better? Sounds better to me. All right. Early writings, page two thirty-five says, um, "Ministers who would not accept this saving message themselves hindered those who would have received it." The blood of souls is upon them. Preachers and people joined to oppose the, this message from heaven and to persecute William Miller and those who united with him in work, in the work. Falsehoods were circulated to injure his influence, and at different times after he had plainly declared the counsel of God, applying cutting truths to the hearts of his hearers, great rage was kindled against him, and as he left the place of meeting, some way laid him in order to take his life, but angels of God were sent to protect him, and they led him safely away from the angry mob. His work was not yet finished. That's pretty significant to know. I mean, everyone has a guardian angel, right? But William Miller, there were angels with him, right? So we're, that's a little bit more than just a guardian angel. And we're going we're gonna to even amp that thought up a little bit higher. Next quote um, from Early Writings 229. God said his angel. And after we read this rather long passage, we're going to identify, if you don't already know, who his angel is. God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. Now, this next sentence, the commencement of the chain of truth was given to him. Underline it, put a circle around it. 
if you have a highlighter, highlight that. This is part of the controversy in Adventism today. You'll see what we mean in a moment. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him, and he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. Now, if you stop there, let me ask a question. I'll try to set up an argument. In the first sentence, she says, God's angel was sent to William Miller. We're going to identify who his angel is in a moment. And then she says, the commencement of the chain of truth was given to him. So who gave William Miller the commencement of the chain, chain of truth? It was his angel, right? So remember that. That's, that's the two points out of this rather long passage that seem relevant in my mind to, to really emphasize. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. That word, word which he regarded as uninspired now opened before his vision in its beauty and glory. He saw that one portion of scripture explains another, and when one passage was closed to his understanding, he found in another part of the word that which explained it. He regarded the sacred word of God with joy and with the deepest respect and awe. As he followed down the prophecies, he saw the inhabitants of the earth were living in the closing scenes of this world's history, yet they, yet they knew it not. That's where we're at today. He looked at the churches and saw that they were corrupt. That's where we're at today. They had taken their affections from Jesus and placed them on the world. They were seeking for worldly honor instead of that honor which cometh from above, grasping for worldly, worldly riches instead of laying up their treasure in heaven. He could see hypocrisy, darkness, and death everywhere. His spirit was stirred within him. God called him to leave his farm as he called Elisha. So William Miller was typified by Elisha. Okay, that's what she's saying here. Right? I'm not... Okay. To leave his oxen his field of labor to follow Elijah. With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. With every effort, he gained strength as John the Baptist. Now she's comparing him not just with Elisha, but with John the Baptist. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. Now, prophetically, I'm probably getting, probably shouldn't do this, but I will. Prophetically, there's three comings of Christ, and I'm not talking about the second coming of Christ. I'm not talking about the second coming of Christ. I'm talking about prophetically. There are three comings of Christ, and John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ to come to the heavenly sanctuary, and William Miller prepared the way for Christ to come to the most holy place. Okay, and Sister White often, in a variety of places, compares the history of Christ, in the history when he came to the heavenly sanctuary, with the history of Millerites, the history when Christ's second coming, coming to the most holy place, prophetic second coming. And he, she uses those two histories to illustrate the history of the latter reign, when Christ's third prophetic coming takes place, when he comes to the judgment of the living. Okay, so prophetically, there are three comings of Christ. I'm not, I'm not dividing the dying the second coming of Christ. I understand the distinction. But Christ came to the heavenly sanctuary in the time period of John the Baptist. He came to the most holy place in the time period of William Miller. And he comes to the judgment of the living during the time period of the latter reign. In each of those histories, the Spirit's pour, poured out. And Sister White often uses those three histories. It's poured out at Pentecost. It's poured out at the midnight cry. It's poured out at the latter reign. And in each of these times when the Spirit is poured out, Christ changes dispensation from earthly to heavenly sanctuary, from holy place to most holy, from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. Okay? As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. I was carried back to the days of the disciples and was shown that God had a special work for the beloved John to accomplish. Who's the beloved John? John the Revelator. Okay, now she's switching from John the Baptist to John the Revelator. Satan was determined to hinder his work, and he led on his servants to destroy John. But God sent his angel. It's the same passage. She, we started this passage. She says that God sent his angel to William Miller. Now she's going to talk about John the Revelator, and she said that God sent that very same angel to John the Revelator to give him the revelation. It's the same angel that was sent to Daniel. It's not just an angel. It's the head angel. What's his name? Gabriel. 
So when we're, when we're belittling the work of William Miller, we need to remember that the being that opened the prophecies to William Miller's mind was no less than the angel Gabriel. And what did he say, the angel Gabriel, of himself? He says, there's nobody that can stand up to me in relation to God's prophetic word other than Michael, your prince. Doesn't, isn't that what he says in the book of Daniel? So in the Bible, we're told that there is no being alive that has a better grasp of the prophecies than the angel Gabriel other than Michael, no doubt the father. But that's the angel that opened the word to William Miller. But God sent his angel and wonderf wonderfully preserved him. All who witnessed the great power of God manifested in the deliverance of John were astonished, and many were convinced that God was with him and that the testimony which he bore concerning Jesus was correct. Those who sought to destroy him were afraid to attempt again to take his life, and he was permitted to suffer on for Jesus. He was falsely accused by his enemies and was shortly banished to a lonely island where the Lord sent his angel to reveal to him events which were to take place upon the earth and the state of the church down to the end, her backslidings and the positions which she should occupy if she would please God and finally overcome. Skip the next paragraph. Go to page 7, continuing on. It says, Preacher and people have looked upon the Re book of Revelation as mysterious and of less importance than other portions of sacred scripture, but I saw that this book is indeed a revelation given for the especial benefit of those who should live in these last days to guide them in ascertaining their true position and their duty. God directed the mind of William Miller to the prophecies and gave him great light upon the book of Revelation. Now, now I, want, I want, to, want you to think about something here, if you would. Here, if we take this into context, and I have a quote here in a moment from Desire of Ages where Sister White plainly tells us that his angel is Gabriel. Okay, we'll have a second witness. We can know that if we want to already, but that's going to be established, okay? The angel that's coming to William Miller is Gabriel, the same angel that came to Daniel, the same angel that came to John the Revelator. And now she's telling us that Gabriel gave great light to William Miller on the book of Revelation. Did you see that? The last phrase there. And gave him great light upon the book of Revelation. But, who is the, there's two, there's two beasts in Revelation 13, is there not? The sea beast and the earth beast. Who's the sea beast? The papacy. Who's the earth beast? The United States. Who did William Miller think the sea beast was? Uh -uh. Pagan Rome. Who do you think the earth beast was? Papal Rome. Uh, the great light that was given to William Miller wasn't Revelation 13. Okay, he was wrong on Revelation 13. Go read his writings. Have you ever read what he said about Revelation 17? Doesn't fit. Okay. And Revelation 2 and 3, the churches, that was established understanding in Christianity many, many years, probably hundreds of years it would be safe to say, before William Miller was born. Okay, so the, the, the understanding of the seven churches of Revelation was light that was already available. That wasn't the great light that was given to William Miller. Revelation 13, Revelation 17, that was not the great, light, great light on Revelation that was given to him. Now, there's only one other passage of Revelation where William Miller waxes eloquent, where you can say, this must be the great light in the book of Revelation that was given to William Miller. And you know what it was? the seals and the trumpets. When we're told that angel Gabriel gave great light on the book of Revelation to William Miller, the only great light you can honestly defend is the seals and the trumpets, which is, it's interesting today now that the Biblical Research Institute of the Seventh-day Adventist Church rejects that light openly. But so do a lot of other ministries and leading people in Adventism today, but they do it without considering where that light came from because it didn't really come from William Miller. And according, if we understand who his angel is, it really didn't come from Gabriel because the book of Revelation tells us where Gabriel gets his information from, doesn't it? Where does Gabriel, Gabriel get his information from? Jesus Christ. 
So the great light that William Miller had on the seals and the trumpets that we're so willing to just throw aside, it came from Jesus Christ, if you follow the logic through. Um, in Daniel's visions, if Daniel's visions had been understood, the people could better have understood the visions of John. But at the right time, God moved upon his chosen servant, who, with clearness and in the power of the Holy Spirit, opened the prophecies and showed the harmony of the visions of Daniel and John and other portions of the Bible and pressed home upon hearts, the hearts of the people, the sacred fearful warnings of the word to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man. Deep and solemn convictions rested upon the minds of those who heard him, and ministers and people, sinners and infidels, turned to the Lord and sought a preparation to stand in the judgment. Angels of God accompanied William Miller in his mission. Okay, now, the first thing I told you, underline, highlight, mark, let's go back there. <laughs> you got you to gotta see this one, all right? It's in the first paragraph from the passage we just read, it says, and it's in bold face, it says, the commencement of the chain of truth was given him. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to William Miller by the angel Gabriel. So now if you go back to where it says the commencement of the chain of truth, this is what William Miller says was given to him in terms of commencement. He says, this is William Miller, from a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of the Gentiles, supremacy must what? Commence when the Jews cease to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronologers assigned to BC 677. That the 2300 days, what? Commenced with the 70 weeks, which the best chronologers dated from BC 40, 457, and that the 1335 days, what? commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after the taking away of pagan abominations and which, according to the best historians I can consult, should be dated from about AD 508. So when Sister White says that, w that the angel Gabriel gave William Miller the commencements in the chain of truth, the three commencements that William Miller identifies that he were give, was given is the starting point for the 2520. 508, the starting point for the 1335, which means in order to come up with 508, you have to receive William Miller's understanding of the daily and 457 to 2300 days. So for those in Adventism today that would tell you that Sister White doesn't put any kind of endorsement on the 2520 or that we can't use her writings to establish the daily, well, there's other places that disagree with that claim also, but this disagrees with it. Sister White tells us that William Miller was given the commencement to the train, chain of truth, and William Miller says the three commencements he was given were 508, 457, and 677. He was given the 2520 time prophecy. He was given the daily and the 1335, and he was given the 2300 years time prophecy. Follow the logic? I heard half the amens. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll move on. All right. His angel, Desire of Ages, next page, page eight. The words of the angel, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of, presence of God, showed that he holds a position of high honor in the heavenly courts. When he came with a message to Daniel, he said, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Of Gabriel, the savior speaks in the revelation, saying that he sent and signified it by what? His angel. So when Sister White says God sent his angel to direct the mind of William Miller in his prophetic understanding, it was Gabriel that came to William Miller. It wasn't simply an angel. It was an angel that only Michael holdeth with him in these things. So when we're also told that Gabriel gave him the commencement and then William Miller gives his faithful testimony and says the commencement I was given was 508 the daily, 677 the 2520, and 457 the 2300 years. If we're going to throw those away, we're not arguing with William Miller, we're arguing with Gabriel. And if you're arguing with Gabriel, you're arguing with Christ. 
So here are some of the things that Miller has been typified by that we've already read from the previous quotes. He, he was typified by Elisha. He was called to his work as Elisha was called to his work. God directed the mind of William Miller. He was the messenger himself. And he was typified by the disciples. The Great Controversy 351 says, the experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. As the disciples went out preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, so Miller and his associates proclaimed the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible was about to expire that judgment was at hand, and that the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. The preachings of the disciples in regard to time was based upon the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by John and his associates announced the termination of the 2300 days of, by Miller and his associates, announced the termination of the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, of which the 70 weeks form a part. The preaching of each was based upon the fulfillment of a different portion of the same great prophetic period. Now, you know, in um, Revelation 11, in verse 3, Revelation 11, and, and I don't have the notes, the Spirit of Prophecy quotes to back this up here. I can point you in the right direction, but you'll get the point, and it's, it's valid. In verse 3, it says, and I will give power under my two witnesses, this is a Revelation 11, verse 3, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. What's this 1260 years? This is the 1200 years of papal rule. And here in verse 3, we're told that the two witnesses, and what are the two witnesses? The Bible. <coughs> He's going to give power to the Bible to, to present a testimony during the time period that the papacy rules the world supremely. All right. And this empowerment that is being identified was the empowerment of the Christian church. What happened to the Christian church during that 1260 years? They fled to the wilderness and they, they gave their message clothed in sackcloth in the wilderness, right? So if you're very careful and you go and determine how the Lord empowered the Christian church to give its testimony to the, during the 1260 years, in Great Controversy, page 48 to 50, it's dealing with the compromise that had come into the Christian church, represented by the papacy, and the true Christian church in there determined that they would do anything to stay in connection with the church other than compromise the truth, and if it meant compromise the truth, then let there be war and separation if need be. You remember that passage in Great Controversy, right around 48 to 50? Well... A close study of the reason why the faithful Christians during that history, when the papacy is getting place upon the throne of the earth, why they, were, why they were willing to make that separation was based upon 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul speaks about the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. They had come to the conclusion that what Paul was describing in 2 Thessalonians, that there must be a falling away first before the man of sin be revealed, those Christians in that history had concluded that the falling away was taking place and the papacy was about to take control of the earth, the man of sin was about to be revealed, and they separated and they were empowered. And their, their empowerment came from the word of God. But Sister White's clear. Sister White's clear that when Paul was writing 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that he was basing it on the book of Daniel. So what I want you to see is what empowered the message of John the Baptist was a prophecy from the book of Daniel. What empowered the Christian church that they could give their testimony to the 1260 years was the book of Daniel. And what empowered the Millerites was a prophecy from the book of Daniel. Now, Sister White, where we just read here, says the same prophecy, Daniel 9, that empowered John the Baptist, was empowering the Millerites. We just read that, right? Same prophecy, different part of it. But the Millerites' message was Daniel 8, 14, and it announced what? The opening of the judgment. What empowers God's church at the end of time is a prophecy from the book of Daniel. 
and it is the same prophecy as the Millerites. Daniel 8, 14, under 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, identifies October 22nd, 1844, but it identifies the beginning of the judgment. But Sister White is clear that God's people at the end of the world, you want me to use that? At the end of the world, we're to announce the close of the judgment. We're to announce the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble. And those events are the last six verses of Daniel 11. And the last six verses of Daniel 11 are nothing more or less, they are absolutely positively the conclusion of Daniel 8.14. It's the same prophecy. Daniel 8.14 is that identifying the opening of the judgment. The last six verses of Daniel 11 are identifying the close of the judgment. And the message of Daniel 9 that empowered John the Baptist is the message of the same message that empowered the Millerites and it's the same message that empowers the 144,000 at the end of time. It's the book of Daniel. And Miller was typified by the disciples. And of course, the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very letter. That's one of the reasons we're developing this typology is to bring it down to the end of the world. Page 8, bottom of the page. A type of Moses in his death. Speaking of William Miller, some of you came in a little bit late, and you may not realize it, but William Miller had two dreams. You're familiar with the dream of William Miller in early writings, no doubt, but he had a dream in 1826 that's rather obscure. Um, we've handed that out. If you didn't get one, we can hand it out to you. But in his dream, it marks all the way marks of William Miller's experience, including his death. And it even ide identifies that he was going to be redeemed, all right? And Sister White says in early writings, page 258, God suffered him to fall under the power of Satan, the dominion of death, and hid him in the grave from those who were constantly drawing him from the truth. Moses erred as he was about to enter the promised land, so also I saw that William Miller erred as he was soon to enter the heavenly Can Canaan in suffering his influence to go against the truth. Others led him to do this, Others must account for it, but angels watch the precious dust of his of this servant of God, and he will come forth at the sound of the last trump. Now, if you get an opportunity to read William Miller's dream tonight or tomorrow morning before we start the one I'm handing out, do so because it it deals a lot with Joshua Himes and his influence, and we're going to try to emphasize this. William Miller is an example of Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world that received the mark of the beast. And in the example that he's left recorded for us, there are three primary mistakes that William Miller makes, and they're all repeated by God's people at the end of the world that received the mark of the beast. And the first mistake of William Miller, she just dealt with, even though she's saying he's been typified by Moses. Moses died, is redeemed. Miller died, is redeemed. But the first mistake for William Miller was trusting men. Okay. He knew better, but he was wore out. He's got an excuse. You and I probably don't have any excuse to be trusting men, all right? But we'll see that as we go on, that, that this is a warning to us here at the end of the world. Um, next quote, he's a type of Elijah. Thousands were led, up, led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller, and servants of God were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the message. Like John, the forerunner of Jesus, those who preached this solemn message felt compelled to lay the axe at the root of the tree and call, up men, call upon men to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Now, when, when we read, if you've read anything about William Miller, Sister White tells us that he was a... A, a humble, loving, kind individual. You, you remember the one passage where she said if he saw an elderly person coming into the back of the meeting and, and it looked like they were having difficulty finding a, a place to sit, he would stop what he was doing and go f make sure they had a place to stay. You know, he was humble. But sometimes we don't remember it. And I, and I, I want to get this quote. I know of this quote, and I want to have it be, to make this point, but I know there's a brother here in this room that knows this quote. What's Miller say when, he, when he's talking about the truth? How's that go? About the, the sword sharpened on both sides. And you <laughs> 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 
Yeah, we need that quote because when William Miller says, don't keep your sword in the sheath, take it out, he's also, he also says something like, make sure it's sharpened on both sides and lay your, lay your opponent down. So he, he was there probably similar to Moses. He's just been compared to Moses, who was the most humble man that ever lived, but he was a champion. For the truth, in fact, we've already read a quote where it said he became stronger at every presentation. He got stronger the more he moved through that history. Um, <coughs> next quote from Early Writings 155, he's a type of Adventism. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the first advent of Jesus. I was pointing down to the last days, our time, and saw that John represented those who should go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to herald the day of wrath in the second advent of Jesus. So if John is typifying Miller, and John is also typifying the 144,000, then Miller is typifying the 144,000. You understand that? There's a couple more seats over here. He's a type of Adventism in the method of study. Now, the, at, at the recent prophecy school that we were at last week, I asked this question. This group here may be a little bit better educated to answer this question, so it might not have such an impact. But usually when I ask this question, it's just a real small minority of people that know the answer. So if you know the answer, don't add, don't say anything. Just raise your hand if you know the answer. I want to ask a question. How many rules of prophetic interpretation are there in William Miller's rules? And don't look at your notebooks. <laughs> Do you, if you know that answer, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Raise it high. Five. Okay, six. So th even here, small minority know how many rules of prophetic interpretation there are. Of William Miller, and fortunately, Leo, when he prepared these, he has the rules on the back. There are 14, okay? So why am I saying that? This next quote, um, which is from the Review and Herald, November 25th, 1884, says this, under a type of Adventism in method of study. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message, and that's what we're professing to be here at the end of the world, right? We are the messengers of the third angel here in the time period when there's earthquakes almost now on a bi week, two times a week. There's a volcano going off. The economy's about to collapse. There's a war going on with Islam, and on and on and on. Here at the end of the world, we're those that are to proclaim the third angel's message, correct? And she says, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies in Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study interpretation. Then she quotes the first five rules of those 14 rules and says this in the third paragraph, the above is a portion of these rules, and in our study of the Bible, we should do, shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. So those people that are going to proclaim the loud cry, latter rain, third angel's message will be using the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller. So my question now is, is how can we be those people if we don't even know how many of those rules there are? It's obvious we're not studying those rules. Or every hand would have went up. And you even had the opportunity when you came in here to look over your notebook and know in advance that it didn't happen because I didn't know it was going to be on the notebook. I'm on page 10 now. He's a type of the 144,000. Elijah was a type of the saints who will be living on the earth at the time of the second advent of Christ who will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and at the last trump. I'm on page 10 from Prophets and Kings 2.27, without tasting death, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. It was as a representative of those who shall thus be thus translated that Elijah, near the close of his earthly ministry, was permitted to stand with Moses, close of Christ's earthly ministry, was permitted to stand with Moses by the side of the Savior on the Mount of Transfiguration. In these glorified ones, the disciples saw in miniature a representation of the kingdom of, of the redeemed, the 144,000 do not die, and then there's Christians that die, and they die in two ways. Moses here is representing the Christians that die of natural causes. 
But John the Baptist in another story represents those Christians that are martyrs. But Elijah, tip of William Miller is a type of Elijah and in that sense William Miller is a type of the 144,000 even though he died. He's, he's typifying the work of the 144,000 because the Millerite history is perfectly repeated in the history of the 144,000. Next one, the Elijah to come. Testimonies, volume 3, page 62. The prophet Malachi declares, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Here the prophet describes the character of the work. Those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by faithful Elijah as John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ's second advent. William Miller was a type of the Elijah to come. And in Malachi 3, verses 1 through 4, we find William Miller specifically identified. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you shall seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Who's the Lord that's the messenger of the covenant? Who's the Lord that is also the messenger of the covenant in this passage? Christ. Right? So this is, this is speaking about Christ suddenly coming into his temple. And in this passage, how many times is, is it noted that he comes to his temple, by the way? It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you sh seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. How many times does the Lord come? Three times. Where do you see three? <laughs> he says, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's the messenger. Who's the messenger in the time when Christ came? Did Christ come twice to his temple in, in that history? He suddenly came to his temple twice and he cleansed it. But John typifies who? Miller. Did Christ come to his temple as the messenger of the covenant on October 22, 1844? So who was the messenger that prepared his way in fulfillment of Malachi 3, verses 1 through 4? William Miller. Now, you have types in the Bible. Type, type, type. The last one is the what? The anti-type. And the last one is the, the primary focus. The anti-type that's be pre been prefigured by this type and this type and this type is the one that all these types are pointing forward to. So John the Baptist and Elijah and Moses, they're typifying William Miller, who prepared the way for Christ to come to his temple and enter into covenant with Adventism on October 22nd, 1844. And William Miller is specifically identified here in the book of Malachi. Do you see that? Now, Lord willing, this weekend, we're going to show you that the Lord came twice to his temple in the Millerite history, just as he came twice to his temple during the time of John the Baptist. And he comes twice to Adventism at the end of the world. And the first time he comes to Adventism at the end of the world was September 11, 2001. And we won't have much time to deal with that, but we will deal with the two temple cleansings. So, for those of you that came in a little bit late, this is William Miller's first dream. And uh, the, the reason I handed it out is because Brother Arnold, who, who commented on William Miller's first dream, is commenting on the 2520, which is one of the arguments. And because I have a couple minutes, I want to put something in place here in advance. If you turn to page 20, 36 in your notes, I don't have the book Prophets and Kings here with me. But if you write this down, you can see if I'm giving an accurate representation of what it says in Prophets and Kings, 
page 382. There's still a chair back here, two here, one there, one there. Prophets and Kings, page 382 says, speaking of Manasseh, when Manasseh was carried into captivity by the Ab Assyrians in 677 BC. When Sister White is addressing that subject in Prophets and Kings, page 382, she says, the first sentence of the paragraph that you need to check out, she says, as an earnest of what would befall the people, and then she describes Manasseh being bound in fetters and carried to Babylon by the Assyrians. No, 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 just stay in page 36. Don't, you haven't got it. I have a note here for myself. You stay in page 36, we're coming to page 36. This is in Prophets and Kings, page 382. Did I say 362? Okay. Manasseh, according to inspiration, was an earnest of what was to come upon Judah. And the word earnest in the Webster's Dictionary of Sister White's day and age means first fruits. Even today, when we buy a house or a car and we give a down payment, another word for that is an earnest payment. It's the first payment. So Sister White is fully in agreement with William Miller. She says the beginning of the punishment of Judah for breaking the covenant began with Manasseh being carried into captivity in the year 677. She says it was an earnest. So it's when these men tell you that Sister White never places her seal of approval on the 2520, she does so in Prophets and Kings, page 382. We've already read where she says that Gabriel gave William Miller the commencements of the chain of truth, and then William Miller tells us that the commencements he were, was given was to the 1335, to the 2520, and the 2300. So it's that Sister White saying, putting her seal of approval on the 2520 and the daily. And then on page 36, it says a mistake in some of the figures. It says, I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted them and that his hand was over and hid a mistake singular in some of the figures, plural, so that none could see it until his hand was removed. In the same book, Sister White explains what the mistake in the figures was. On page 235, she says this, the prophetic periods that closed in 1843. You everyone with me? This is that, brothers and sisters, in the argument over the 2520, this one here, this is rock solid. You get this one into your head where you understand the logic of this, you won't be shaken, and you can defeat anyone that says that Sister White says, doesn't, that they say Sister White does not endorse the 2520. And, and you do it with the, the words of Sister White, which is just ordinary English. It's not Hebrew or Greek, all right? Anyone can understand it. She said... Page 74, a mistake, singular, in some of the figures. Then she tells us what the mistake is on page 235 in the same book. She, saw, she says, I saw the people of God joyful in expectation, looking for their Lord. But God designed to prove them. His hand covered a mistake in the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Periods in the plural. His hand covered the reckoning in the pro prophetic periods. Not in one period. Periods in the plural, all right? Those who were looking for their Lord did not discover this mistake in the singular. It's a single mistake. And the most learned men who reposed the time also failed to see it. Those faithful disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. Plural. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures. Plural. And the mistake, singular, was explained. Now notice what she says. They saw that the prophetic periods that reached to 1844, they saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844 and that the same evidence which they had presented to show that the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved that they would terminate in 1844. Wow. Now, brothers and sisters, she's, she's talking about this chart, period. That's, what, that's the context. She says it was a mistake, singular, on this chart, and it impacted figures in the plural, 
And she also calls the figures prophetic periods. Then she tells us that the prophetic periods that it impacted were the prophetic periods that ended in 1843. And there's only three on the chart that ended in 1843. There's this one down here, the 1335, the 2300, and the 2520. And there was a mistake. The Lord held his hand over a singular mistake that caused an error in the figures. And brothers and sisters, this, this time prophecy that ends in 1843, no mistake. That's not a mistake. We, Sister White says that William Miller was given the commencement to the chain of truth, and William Miller says that one of the commencements he was given was 508. And if you take 508 and you add 1335, you come to 1843. There's no mistake there. That's simple math. That's rock solid. She's not talking about this. The Lord didn't hold his hand over this. This is correct. But these two, these, these aren't correct. She says that they then discovered that the same evidence that had led them to identify 1843 proved that they terminated in 1844. And the only two time prophecies on this chart that she could possibly be identifying are the 2300 and the 2520. She's putting her seal of approval on the 2520 time prophecy and saying that it ends in 1844. That's three places where she's nailing it down for us if we're willing to see. Let me show you one other thing, and not all of you will have this. It's in William Miller's dream. I want to give you, if I can turn right to it, and I don't know that I'm that familiar with it. Okay. On page 11 of William Miller's dream that we handed out, when David Arnold is commenting on William Miller's first dream, this isn't his second dream, this is an early writing, this is in his first dream. On page 11, He's getting to the conclusion of his commentary. He's dealing with the fact that Advent, the, the Millerites were scattered at the disappointment of 1844, and then there was a shaking. There was an argument going on in that history. So as he's describing that history, he's telling them what truths have been established as true since 1844, and that they're still rock solid. And here's what he's saying. On that last paragraph... Uh, the sentence before that last paragraph says, Our limits will not permit us to show up all the truths held by this portion of Advent believers. Are you with me? We will, however, point out a few. So he's going to tell them the truths that they've discovered since 1844. We hold that the divine hand has guided us through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. The reason I'm throwing this into the context is this was 1855. This is a pioneer that is writing this, and James White takes his article and puts it in the Review and Herald. Therefore, this pioneer and James White are in agreeing with this, okay, in 1855, five years after this chart is printed. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, and that we are now in the third angel's message. If any man worship the beast etc. The same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, etc. Soon to be poured out, which will constitute the seven last plagues. These are, these are truths that he's now identifying. And, he, and throughout this, he's kind of, he cuts his sentences sort of short. That the law of God was abolished at the cross, that the law of Moses was abolished at the cross, but no part of the law of God, the Ten Commandments, consequently the seventh day Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That none can be said to be keeping the commandments of God while they keep only nine of them. That the Sabbath is the seal of the living God. That the 2300 days ended in the fall of 1844 when our high priest commenced the work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, which is now in the process of cleansing. That at that point in time, the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled. 1844, the times of the Gentiles, the 2520. Okay, so it's pioneer understanding. And we've given you three places where Sister White agrees with 2520. And in one of those, she's also agreeing with William Miller's understanding of the daily. And there are other places. But what I'm trying to do here, my, my purpose of this presentation, the first couple, is to identify William Miller as a type. Okay, And we're going to show how he typifies us here at the end of the world and show that the same testing process that they went through, we go through. Um, shall we pray? <laughs> 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 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that you accomplished through William Miller. We thank you that he was willing to be led by your angel Gabriel and that the work that he began you are now attempting to finish among your people. We ask that you would put us in a position where we can understand our responsibility with this work and in a position where we can see what we have to change in order to become part of that work. We thank you for the Sabbath which is beginning here and we ask for a special blessing of these sacred hours, special anointing. And as we realize what's going on in the world, we ask that you would make uh, this weekend of such a nature that it will somehow uh, bring conviction into each of us to be about the business of finishing the work in our own lives, that we can become a tool in your hands, that we can participate in this finishing work. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.